y'all are gonna get sued. Oh my God. Why do you say that? What makes you say that? Because uh, they're never gonna admit. they did any of these things and then I'm just a liar and now I'm trying to get attention I mean literally it's why I don't use my name right I don't use the name they gave me because I don't all the success I have is because of me not because of them <sighs> The body protects you. It protects your memory. When you go through trauma, your body protects you by not letting you remember these awful things that happen. And a lot of awful things happen to me. I don't remember anything. I don't remember being on a plane. I don't remember getting off a plane. I just remember all of a sudden I'm in this Jewish home with this Jewish family just all of a sudden I'm there. So I, I start getting memories around three or three and a half or something like that. My adopted parents didn't think they could have children. They adopted first my brother through Jewish Family Services. Jewish Family Services were part of the, the AIM program, Adopt an Indian Meti program. My adopted parents, they were given a big book of pictures of indigenous children from all over Canada. And they flipped and flipped and they got to that picture and they're like, I'll take her. The social worker put me on a plane from Thompson, Manitoba and brought me here to Montreal. When I was adopted at three, I was put into the mikvah, instant Jew. They changed my name. I went to Hebrew school. Synagogue on Friday nights, having the Jewish holidays, going to Florida in the, in the winter time. But just before I was adopted, my adopted parents got pregnant. They had their own child. And I remember seeing the bond between my little sister and, and my parents and going, I don't got that. That, that doesn't exist for me. I knew that I was almost like a visitor in this home. The kind of interactions I had with my mother were very hard. I was upset about something and I was crying. And she didn't like to hear me cry. So she taped my mouth shut. And that's when I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> this is what it's like here. My father was very much into building his company. He didn't really speak to me. My parents were like, just, you know, assimilate into this culture, be brought up as a nice Jewish girl. It'll be easier for you. I mean, I remember literally one winter walking around the, the neighborhood and looking at the sky and thinking, I have a mother and sister out there. And then it was gone. There was never any details about what happened with my family, and my parents were like, you're not really Native, you're maybe 118th Indian. They would be like, don't you know that Natives are the dregs of society? They used to give me this like analogy. If you go to a Jewish household and you sit at a table, you'll have all kinds of food. If you go to an Indian household, you'll have drugs and alcohol. Because I did have a blonde brother and a blonde sister, they were just like, tell people you're Israeli. I wanted to please them, and I wanted to be accepted, and I wanted to fit into this family, and I wanted to be loved. I started to develop, like, self-hate. I didn't like the way I looked. I didn't like the color of my skin. I, I knew that when I looked in the mirror, what came back was a Native face. When I was a teenager, I was just, like, trying to erase my identity because I wanted to be accepted, but I was never. I've sort of developed like a bit of an eating disorder. 
I was like super nervous all the time. I was very quiet. I kind of meek and only got strength when I spent time with her. My Bubby is my father's mother. I often think that the reason why I'm a good person today is because of her. She gave me unconditional love. Like she just thought I was the most amazing kid. She was like the anchor, the only person that I could talk to and feel comfortable with and always had a smile for me and always was happy to see me. And that was like a huge contrast to everyone else <laughs> in the household. She was that elder that always believed in me. And she saw like great things. She's like, you're gonna do great things one day. And I was like, no, I'm gonna end up in jail. I'm gonna be a prostitute. That's what I've been told and I'm sure of it. I had zero belief that I was gonna do anything Can you turn it up? Well, it's sort of two things. One is that I'm, uh, I've sent a letter to Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, the Native Women's Shelter has been working really hard for the last 10 years to create a second stage housing for Indigenous women and their children. So currently in Montreal, there is no place for Indigenous women and children to live. If uh, the Prime Minister would go to the UN and make these promises that we're just saying, hey, we're here. And it's time for, for, for the government to back up those promises. Absolutely. Nakosette is the executive director of the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. Thanks for doing this. Okay, I gotta wear that yeah, dress more often. Too. Seriously. <laughs> it got to a point that it was so hard to live at home that I thought I was going to just kill myself. So one night I just packed up some clothes and I left. I spent a couple of years really struggling to figure out what is my purpose? What is my path? Do I live as a white woman? Do I live as an indigenous woman? What do I do? After I moved out, I spent a lot of time with my bubby. We actually got a lot of strength and understanding from one another, but um, she got cancer and she knew she was dying. And she knew that I would not have anyone. Because she knew that she wouldn't be there for me anymore. So she said, I mean, I help you find your family. And we did this like letter writing campaign and we wrote to all these programs. My name is so-and-so and I'm looking for my mother and my sister. And then when we finally found my biological family, she sent me the plane ticket. She goes, go. Not only did I meet my biological family, but I got my status and I became like, Born again Indian. It's like, somebody get me a choker. I changed my name. I went back to school. I got a degree in uh, applied human sciences. I started volunteering at the Native Women's Shelter. And after one day of volunteering there, they hired me. Gradually, I moved from one position as a frontline worker to an outreach worker to a liaison worker to a program coordinator, and then eventually as the executive director. One of the first initiatives I took on was youth protection. Didn't work out so good for me. What are y'all doing in youth protection now that we're seeing that the women that were in care as a child now have children in care? Why is this continuing? And what are you doing to stop it? Here in Montreal, there's no second stage housing exclusively for Aboriginal women and their children. So what happens is the women that go to the shelter, they finish their stay and then they come back. Because so many Indigenous kids are currently in care, and because I see the mothers suffer, and because I'm lucky enough to be exactly where I am, then you need to like extend those hands and bring up everyone else. I is executive director of the Native Women's Shelter. For 10 years now, the Native Women's Shelter has been trying to create a second stage housing for Indigenous women and their children. And there's generational trauma that affects us deeply, and we're still struggling with it to this day. So some I was really close to going down the wrong path, like inches away from being having a completely different life. So many other Native adoptees have had just unbelievably traumatic experiences. So many are kind of lost. Society just discards them. 
I'm still alive and I'm sober. I have my kids. Like, I'm a first generation to like keep my children. That is breaking the cycle. They'll never know what it's like to not be loved and cherished. The parenting skills that I have come from my bubby. I am here because of my bubby. This is the only reason why. If I am a good mother, it's because of my bubby. If I am a kind person, it's because of my bubby, because I was not brought up that way. That love was stronger than all the toxicity that made me believe in who I was, exactly who I am. And it made me want to continue fighting for Indigenous people. I sent uh, a letter to the Prime Minister because he made lots of promises at the UN that he would um, help Indigenous people, especially women and children. Well, I love the fact that I can share about my bubby because she was absolutely the best influence in my life. Oh my God, she would be so proud. She would be so proud. Literally, when I got the Women of the Year Award, I dedicated it to my bubby. Everyone knew. I am here because of my bubby. I dedicate this award to all those who inspire, to all my mentors and to all my friends, and to my bubby. This is the day you told me about, bubby. I wish... I wish you were here to see me receive this award. The reason why I experienced everything I did was to bring me exactly to where I am now so that I can push forward. Growing up being told, you're never gonna amount to anything. It was almost like a rebellion to succeed. And that continues, like I can't turn that off. I want indigenous people to feel strong, kind of like that feeling that I first got when I went to a powwow. So I'm trying to make opportunities for indigenous people. And then eventually you kind of like, like, like a relay race, like a baton, like you pass it on to that next generation and they go with it. Not quite there yet. I still think I got another, maybe another 20 years, we'll see. Wait, 15 years, I don't know.